here are the basic components of a nucleosome you should all be familiar with. It's about 150 base pairs of DNA wrapped tightly around an octamer core made up of eight histone proteins. Uh, the DNA, in order to adopt this uh, structure, has to be severely bent relative to what it is in a B-form DNA. So B-form DNA would be quite straight and rigid. You can see the DNA arcs around and has to bend quite severely. To do that, uh, the major groove has to expand over here. The minor groove has to expand on this side and contract on that side. Uh, so the, the point is the DNA is uh, severely changed relative to the B-form DNA. And if you're a DNA binding protein, this is the thing you have to be looking for if it's on the surface of a nucleosome. The octamer core is composed of eight copies of four histones, H2A, H2B, H3, and H4. Uh, we can only see four copies here. We can flip it over and take a look at the other side. It's symmetrical. Here's the other side. Just kidding. Uh, it looks exactly the same, uh, so I'm not going to show it to you here. We'll see it uh, flip around in a minute. Uh, but just remember there are eight copies of each of the, the histones. Uh, we're only looking at four on this face. You can see that the histones interdigitate with each other quite intimately as well. So H2A and H2B uh, are, are forming like a handshake with each other here. The C-terminal tail of H2A is sitting in a groove at the surface of the H3-H4 tetramer. Uh, so all of the histones fit together uh, very intimately to make this nucleosome. And you can imagine that mutations in, in these uh, uh, proteins would have severe uh, consequences for being able to form this structure. And that's uh, presumably why the histones are so highly conserved throughout evolution. So here's another view of the same thing where we've turned the, the core histone proteins into ribbon form so you can still see the DNA making that left-handed helix into the board uh, wrapping around this histone octamer core. Uh, but now you can start to see that there are, uh, there's another copy on the other side and you can start to see how the, the, uh, the histones are, are making intimate contact with the DNA in order to al allow it to bend uh, the way it is. And this is just a third view of the same nucleosome with uh, all of the surfaces removed so you can start to get uh, a sense for how things are arranged relative to one another. I think it's easier to, to take a look at this view to see sort of the skeleton of the nucleosome. Uh, but remember in that surface filling view uh, how, how much contact there is between all of these components. So let's go ahead and let this thing rock back and forth so you can get a sense for the three-dimensional structure. Uh, we'll f fill in the, the surfaces of the octamer here. Take a look at how the, uh, the, the DNA is being intimately contacted uh, by these, uh, the, the histones. Uh, and it gives you some more sense for the, uh, the other side of the molecule as well. Uh, we're not looking at the tails of the histones that are coming out. Uh, you, you can see uh, where they come through, though. Here's one uh, of the H2B tails coming out over here, the other one coming out right over here. Uh, and you can see the H3 tail coming out between the gyres of the DNA uh, down here. So there's a lot going on in a nucleosome where, uh, with contact with the DNA, the tails of the histones that are coming out either at the surface uh, or between the gyres. Uh, and those are going to be places where we're going to regulate both the assembly and disassembly of nucleosomes and the properties of a nucleosome. Now, the histones each have individual jobs within the nucleosome, uh, but they're all built on the same structural platform called the histone fold. So this little video takes them apart uh, and, and lets you see the histone fold that's the core of each of the uh, structures of the nucleosomes. So here's the four histones uh, being taken apart with just their histone fold core. You can see there's uh, three alpha helices uh, that are all arranged in space in a similar way. Here they're being arranged just so that that similarity is more obvious, so that they've been lined up so that their histone uh, folds are 
are, are more obviously similar to each other, and here we put them back into a nucleosome. So just so you're aware, you'll hear this term histone fold. Uh, that's what we're talking about. It's just that core of each of the histones has the same structural motif. Of course, the reason we care about any of this in this particular class on gene expression uh, is because DNA uh, molecules aren't 150 base pairs long. They're much longer than that. And so there are multiple nucleosomes arranged in arrays. And any time a polymerase, here an RNA polymerase, uh, wants to get to the information in the DNA, it's got a fairly... Uh, difficult task ahead of it in order to get the DNA off of that nucleosome and also to put it back on because we have to keep uh, this barrier to prevent access to the DNA in place all the time except for that brief moment when we want to get through. So here's an RNA polymerase about to encounter a nucleosome and you can Im imagine the difficulty that it faces. It, it both has to take the thing apart and put it back together, all the while trying to make a copy of the information. But the problem is even worse than that. Uh, if we take a look at uh, real chromatin inside of a cell, uh, we see that it doesn't just form these beads on a string of nucleosomes on DNA. Uh, they form these higher order structures, 30 nanometer fibers, whose uh, structure we're still trying to figure out, frankly. Uh, but it looks like it, it, it forms something like this where any uh, two nucleosomes pass the DNA from one wrapping around this guy and then back through a linker to the other nucleosome next to it, and then that passes it back to a nucleosome adjacent to the first one. So instead of sort of a linear array of nucleosomes, we get the impression that nucleosome one over here passes its DNA back into the board. That passes the DNA back to nucleosome two over here, uh, and so on, so that we get this large helical structure. Now imagine yourself being the RNA polymerase and encountering this as the structure with all of the linker DNA that we normally think of as being free of nucleosomes down the center of this structure. So this poses a geometrical problem, a structural problem that we have to at least think about when we're imagining how chromatin gets both compacted and decompacted so that we can access the DNA. Uh, fairly formidable looking structure. So since nucleosomes form such a potent barrier to progression of polymerases or even just to accessing the information in a DNA molecule, uh, it's going to matter a lot for gene expression where the nucleosome is, where its precise, precise position is, and we'll be talking a lot about that uh, in this section of the class. So one of the things we'll be talking about is that particular DNA sequences have a different ability to position the, the histone octamer core. And the reason is because of that bending. So it just turns out that some DNA sequences are easier to put in some positions. It's easier to have a sequence that will open up the major groove and a, or a sequence that will compact the minor groove near the histones one that will open up the, the grooves away from the histones. So some DNA molecules just fit better with this scheme of opening and closing those, those grooves. Uh, so if we look at what, where a DNA, uh, where, where a, the histone octomer wants to position itself naturally along a DNA molecule, we see that the histones from uh, synthetic sequences, the sequences from uh, from chicken DNA sequences, from yeast DNA, it doesn't matter where the DNA came from or where the histones came from. They all have this property of wanting to have AT-rich sequences uh, in per particular positions along the nucleosome and GC-rich sequences at other positions. So, of course, natural DNA sequences don't have good convenient sites uh, f uh, for uh, positioning the nucleosome necessarily, they have to encode information. But they do have a sequence, and that sequence is going to interact with the, the histone core and provide a preferred place for the, uh, the octomer to sit. So DNA sequences do have a preference for sitting at particular sequences, for, at position, particular positions within the nucleosome, uh, and that will play into our gene expression uh, rubric when we start to talk about where the nucleosomes are and how that affects gene transcription. Okay, and as a final point, 
Uh, I just want to mention that the crystal structures I was showing you don't have a significant part of the histones uh, represented. The N-terminal tail of uh, H2B here, the N-terminal tail of H3, they're quite long, 20 to 30 residues, uh, and yet they don't sit still. They aren't in the crystal structure because they don't have unique positions within the, the, the nucleosomal structure. They're just sort of flopping around in the breeze. Now, the positions that are highlighted here uh, in red are ones that are going to be modified, and that's going to be a uh, subject of our later discussion when we talk about how those modifications might alter the properties of a nucleosome. But I just want this mental image that a lot of those modifications aren't happening in a place that might disrupt the properties, the, the physical structure of the nucleosome itself, the interaction between the histones and DNA. Instead, they're sort of sitting out here, floating around in the breeze, uh, signaling uh, what kind of a nucleosome this is. It's more information than it is structural. Uh, so uh, just remember when we look at those crystal structures that we're missing a lot of the information, we're not looking at uh, a substantial part of each of the histones that, is, uh, that, that doesn't show up in the crystal structure.